grew up in Providence, Rhode Island. I live in Los Angeles now, but I grew up in Providence, Rhode Island, and I still have a lot of ties. My family's there, and I still go back. That's about an hour outside of Boston, New England in the States, and uh, beautiful place, you know, right near Brown University and all that. Uh, so I grew up there playing in bands and doing my thing, you know. Well, I started singing, I started playing guitar at the age of nine, and I would say about maybe six months into that, I was practicing one day in front of the family, uh, playing an old platter song uh, called Only You. I was trying to play the melody to it, and my dad had, su had suggested that, uh, you know, tr try singing with, with it, and, uh, you know, I hadn't mastered playing and singing at the same time, so the attempt to do that it was quite funny, so I got a laugh out of the family, which I didn't think was very funny. funny yeah. So I went into my room and slammed the door, and I practiced for a couple of hours, and came back out and sang it. And they were kind of surprised that uh, that I was did it that fast, and they encouraged me. But I would say the moment would be when I first sang at an assembly in school, in in like sixth or seventh grade, and just got up and sang like on Broadway, George Benson classic, wow. you know, and played guitar and sang it and just saw the reaction, you know, and the reaction from the women and the girls and everything <laughs> was kind of like, I think I, I think I want to do this for a living. Yeah. So that kind of broke me out of my shell, yeah. Ooh, I got this feeling that I'm living. Stevie Wonder, of course, Marvin Gaye, Donny Hathaway's big influence, George Benson, because, you know, playing guitar and singing, uh, when I was growing up, that was an idol because he did it really, really well, and I'd, I'd like to fancy myself playing guitar and singing the same way he did. So, uh, not as good, but you know, I attempted, I strived for. It. So, uh, <laughs> think people like that. A lot, a lot of. But I also, growing up in an Italian household, uh, Frank Sinatra was being played to wake me up every morning to go to school. So I would was also influenced by a lot of that stuff. A lot of the big band jazz singers, and I had a sister who was six years older than me and was quite into the Motown sound. So she. She was bringing that stuff home, Earth, Wind & Fire, every day and listening to it. And the Beatles was another huge influence, obviously, just yeah. to the songwriting styles and the way they produce their stuff. So, um, and I'm luck lucky enough to have older siblings that listen to all that stuff. I got a record deal with MCA Records and uh, that was the way they wanted to introduce me uh, by as being an R&B artist instead of a pop artist, you know. Yeah. So they, they basically saw an opportunity where this guy was coming out with a record, the great George Howard, and uh, they, they asked him, he had a song on it, I, I believe there was another vocalist on the song at the time, a very good vocalist, yeah. you know. Uh, but this was a chance to introduce me as an R&B artist, which is what they wanted to promote me. And in the States at that time, you know, introducing a white guy as an R&B artist, I was on the R&B division of the, of the label, I was the only white guy. So uh, they wanted to do it carefully and, and, and strategically, and that was one of the ways they wanted to do it. And it worked out really well, it was great, because I was coming from that world, I was always the only white guy in an R&B band growing up, you yeah. know, so it was great. And uh, MCA, that was um, Lul Silas Jr. That was his uh, his brainchild to do that. He unfortunately is not with us anymore, but he was a great, great a &R guy, and he really got me, you know, he understood where I was coming from, so, yeah. yeah. Well, the story on how I got it is pretty interesting. Uh, I used to play in an R&B band. I had my own R&B band with my brother, who's a drummer, and uh, we, we played in the Rhode Island area, and then we started expanding. We got to be pretty popular for a club band, you know? And we started playing in, in, in Massachusetts, and we'd play in places in, in right upstate New York also. So we started playing this club called September's in, in, in upstate New York, and it was a very R&B heavy club, and, and we were an all white R&B band. <laughs> But they loved us, you know, and it was the kind of club where there was a, right in front of the stage, there was a big shelf and people would put their bear down and they would just stick, like, show me what you got. And yeah. they, they were critics in this club. And I, I appreciated that because we had our stuff together, you know. Yeah. So we'd go there and everybody kept saying, you know, Mike Tyson, the heavyweight champion of the world, comes in this club. He's going to come in and, and, you know, be on your best tonight. He came in one night, you know, and I was singing, I was singing Stevie Wonder, Ribbons in the Sky. Uh, and I was up front singing and I was playing my guitar and he came right up with the club owner and, and just was staring me down watching me and basically um, you know a lot of people especially at that time uh, thought I didn't look anything like I sounded or talked. My speaking voice as you know is quite different than my singing yeah. voice and and he came up to me afterwards and said I, you know I don't really believe that was you singing you know I want to hear you sing I want to hear you sing without any music and I said well let's go in the kitchen in the back and I'll sing for you without any music so 
he was impressed that I kind of called him out on that, yeah. you know, or he called me out, and I, I said, let's go. So we went in the back, just he and I, and I sang. I sang a little bit of a Jeffrey Osborne song for him, and he was blown away. And I can't tell you, he put me like in a headlock and kind of was, you know, in a loving kind of way, and yeah. was just like, that was great, you know, you really, you, you went for it, and I appreciate that. He says, you're not afraid to show people what you got, and I said, hey, you know, especially you, and, and he said, so, Whenever one of you guys playing here again, I want to come. So he trained only a half hour away from where we were playing. So he'd come to the club every time we would play there, and he and I would go for breakfast at times and talk about music. He's a big music lover. Yeah. So one day it was just, you know, why don't you sing a national anthem at one of my fights? You know, and uh, he was fighting Frank Bruno in Las Vegas, the Las Vegas Hilton. Wow. And uh, I went and I said, sure, Mike, I'll do it. You know, I went there and. Mike and Don King and I went out and bought a black tuxedo for me and it was really really nice and uh, still have that you know and then I just uh, went up there and I, I, I sang the national anthem and a very 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 powerful executive at the time that was chairman of uh, MCA records uh, his assistant was right in the audience and um, she saw me his name was Irving Azoff he's still very very uh, popular in the industry okay. today he manages all kinds of acts and takes over record companies so he's uh but he he signed me uh she she had me in his office like 48 hours later wow and um he signed me but he wanted to sign me to the r b division of the of the uh company and that is when i met Lil silas who i spoke of earlier and next came the george howard and then you know three years to make this record that wow. that that, uh, that was really really a learning experience for me getting to work with such great producers and you know nothing was spared money wise uh, and 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 that was a great thing great way to be introduced to the to the industry and, yeah. and and learn a lot you know i wish i knew now what i knew i wish i knew then what i knew now but you know i wouldn't know it if it wasn't for that experience so really really a great experience yeah now that's incredible it's a chunk of my life it's like a marriage you yeah. know for yeah. 3 years it's just you're doing nothing but uh, uh, working on that and, and you know, just you'd, you'd be amazed at the songs that we did that, that, you know, after a year and a half, two years, we're going, well, these songs we did two years ago, they're not quite up to par with what we've got now, so we've had to get rid of things and I mean, some of these things were great too, you know, they just yeah. sounded a little dated for the time, uh, but it was amazing. I got to work with some producers like George Duke who weren't even, didn't, those songs didn't make it on the record, but yeah. the learning experience through doing things like that were just amazing for me, you know, and still remain friendly with all those guys now, you know. One of the ballads that I really like to sing is Tenderly. I just think yeah. it's a classic R&B kind of ballad that I really, really loved. Um, obviously, you know, let's get to it the, 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 for the upbeat type stuff and yeah. um, the hip hop -y kind of thing. Yeah. But I, I really, really like a lot of the ballads too. Um, they just they just kind of touched me. And at that point in my life, you know, I, I was doing a lot of writing with some of the producers too. I like Maybe We Can Fall In Love Again. Um, I like the song Masculinity too, because it has, a, it has a kind of Marvin Gaye groove. And I, I did all the background vocals on that so there's wow. a certain marriage between the lead vocal and the background vocals that just kind of trying to trying to infuse a little of that Marvin Gaye sound in there so I really really like the groove on that one I'd say those are my top favorites you know those three you know it came about where I was actually at home in Rhode Island because I would be you know they would record four or five songs with me in Los Angeles I wasn't quite living in Los Angeles yet and then they'd send me home for a couple of months at a time uh, while while we figured out a game plan but while I was home and I thought I was gonna remain home for a couple of months I got this kind of emergency call um, I believe they, they were gonna have Jeffrey Osborne sing this song uh, but he, there was a label conflict. I think he was with Arista Records at the time, and and uh, and this was being done on Universal MCA. So seeing that I was an MCA artist, um, George Duke, who I'm so glad he did, he said, "Well, you know, if Jeffrey can't do this song, I, I know a guy that can that I've been working with that you guys have on your own label right now, and I would suggest him." So he did, and they took him up on it, and they called me and they said, "Can you be out here?" like the day after tomorrow and have this song learned. I had never heard it, you know. Yeah. So on the plane I had my, you know, my little Walkman at the time <laughs> and I was just listening, listening, listening and then just went in the studio and sang it and it was a great, great experience. It all happened so quickly, you know, but uh, it's something that I'm proud of to this day and I have, I have people that really just say they wake up in the morning and get inspired by listening to that song. It's a very yeah. inspirational, gospel yes. kind of song and some of the voices that are singing background on that song are some pretty incredible people, like, you know, uh, Names that you would know in the R&B world because George had so many contacts. So it's an honor to have a choir like that in back of me of people, you know, that are just singing uh, so great. So very proud of that also. Best I ever was, I was with you. No, 
to be on a set, which I, I had been on movie sets before, but never to the situation where I had my own trailer. Um, you know, it was, you can understand why people want to become movie stars, yeah. singers that want to become movie stars. You, you're treated like a god for like, you know, the time that you're there. It's amazing. I mean, anything you want, uh, you, you know, you, I had the big wardrobe person. I had people walking around with makeup bags with my name on it to make sure everything was perfect for each scene. And it was a great, he was great walking around the set. You run into Christopher Walken, you run into Adam Sandler, you run into Kate Beckinsale and, you know, you're hanging out at a table at one in the morning just talking with them because these things go to shoot a scene like I did which is probably about a four or five minute scene we were we were doing that for about a week you know wow. the, the whole scene itself not just my part and to get a speaking part and introduce him up it was my first experience acting in a major movie so all in all it was an absolutely great experience and it doesn't hurt for your publicity of people knowing what you're doing out there and I was glad that I got to be a singer in the movie because that's what I do you know so yeah very comfortable yeah I came out with a CD recently in the last couple of years that's a very big Sinatra kind of CD. Uh, I did it at Capitol Recording Studios. Um, people that listen to my R&B stuff probably wouldn't know much about this because it's a completely different kind of music. But, you know, it, it was a great experience going into Capitol and with a big, 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 big band. I mean, you know, horns and, 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 and real strings and everything. The way they did it back in the day and recording everything all at once. Um, I kind of fell in love with doing that stuff. So a lot of people may not know that and I, I'm really enjoying it because it fits with what I'm doing with Burt now. But I'm also work getting back to my R&B roots. I never left them, but I want to get back to making a, a CD for people like, like your listeners that, that listen to the stuff that I did so many years ago. So I just... Um, kind of working on some stuff right now. I'm going to play you a little bit of it later, but I, uh, I'm, I'm hopefully we'll be finishing it in the next couple of months, you know, and that's something people wouldn't know about just yet, but that's, that's pretty much it. I mean, I guess that and that, uh, maybe that I play guitar. A lot of people probably okay. don't know that. I started yeah. playing guitar and, you know, I, there's not been many opportunities for me to sit down on a stage and accompany myself with the guitar and singing, and that's something that I want to get more into doing, you know. Yeah. But when MCA signed me, they were, they they signed me for my voice. They yeah. saw me as a singer singing a national anthem, so it wasn't a route they wanted to go, but it's it's definitely a route that I want to explore in the future in my upcoming stuff, you know. Well, I'll tell you, it came about from MCA Records. Uh, yeah. When they signed me, they they really felt I had a classic voice and they, they wanted to get some classic songwriters to, um, to, to you know, just to seat that voice. So, so they, they took me to see Barry Mann, who did the song The Best I Ever Was on, on, the, um, on, the, on the album, yeah. which is a great song. And he wrote songs like, like, like on Broadway, Just Once, James Ingram. I mean, to name a few, he's, he's, he's had a ton of mega hits. And we did a song with him that the best that ever was that came out really really great and in that same field they said well how about Burt Back? I mean I wouldn't I, I would have said Burt Backrack but I just thought it, it was unreachable and they said well let's go see Burt Backrack who's married to Carol Bayer Sager at the time and um, a great songwriter in her own right you know so the next thing I knew me and Lul Silas Jr. were driving up this long driveway in Bel Air in Beverly Hills there and, and uh, we went to this beautiful house and to a music room and, and their in walks Burt Bacharach and Carol Bayer Sager. And this is probably in 1993 or 92, you know. And I'm just in awe that they're there and they're playing them songs that I had recorded with George George Duke and they, they listened to them and they said, wow, you have a really strong voice, really great voice. And they played me some songs. Unfortunately, at the time, they had a lot of ballads and we were kind of ballad heavy on the record. So it didn't really work out, but the introduction was made and uh, they they heard me sing and I and obviously I knew about their credits and uh, and that was the end of that and then when everything fell apart with the record deal years later and uh, the guy who signed me had left so things didn't work out the way I wanted them to and so I'd say about a good seven years later wow. I got this phone call and it's Bert you know who I've never talked to on the phone like that and, I, and at this point I figured had just forgotten who I was and he said, hey, you know, it's Burt Bacharach. If you can call me back, I'm in Dallas right now working with a symphony. Here's the number. So I called him back and he uh, he just started explaining to me. I said, Burt, how are you? He's like, great. I said, he goes, oh, I never forgot the day you came into my house and you sang and I always remembered your voice. And I've never used a male singer on stage before. I've always had two girls singing all the Dion stuff and anything male. I just kind of work my way through it. He goes, but I'm about to go do this tour 
probably be about three or four months, he said, you know, and we're going to do some small theaters, 3,000 seaters, and I'd like to use a guy. And if I use a guy, I want it to be you. I said, wow, do you, I'm surprised you remember what I said. He goes, no, I never forgot what you sound like. And when you get back to L.A., because uh, I was at home with it in Rhode Island at the time, he says, come over to my house and see if you like me as a person. And I was like, oh, I'm sure I like it. You know? <laughs> so I went over there expecting to maybe sing for him. I brought my guitar. The guitar never came out of the case. He just started telling me that this would be a great move for me to do and that I could still pursue other things and that I should really do it. And I, I know this is going to sound odd, but I was very, very leery of doing it at the time because I was just coming out of a record deal yeah. and there was another label interested in me and I felt like it might take me away. And I had a lot of trouble deciding, but I went into it with the attitude of let me do it for a couple of months and if it doesn't work out, it's something I... I'll leave, you know, but now this is going on my 16th year with him. And wow. I couldn't have, um, I mean, I, I, it was one of the greatest decisions I've ever made because I've seen the world and, I, and I've seen it in a way that a lot of people would never see it. I'm yeah. going to sing at the Sydney Opera House tonight. There, there's singers in the States that are famous that have never sang at the Sydney Opera, Opera House, House, you know. Yeah. So through Bert and through his iconic status and, and, and you know, well-deserved iconic status. It's just been amazing, you know, to, and things that I've learned from this man, you know, just about singing. When I made that album, I didn't know Bert, you know, yeah. and, I, and, I, and, I, and I, believe me, I'm proud of what I did, but I just have learned so much since then about, you know, just giving and taking with your voice and when to use it and when not to use certain things and how to make yourself, you know, how to make your voice give people goosebumps, which is yeah. what it's all about, you know, yeah. and, and, it's just been an amazing ride, and I, I want it to go on as long as it can, you know? So it's, Hopefully it does. Yeah, yeah. And in the meantime, I'm, I'm also, through this, through doing this with Bert, I have developed my own symphony show, which I'm working in the States quite a bit now, wow. with, with symphonies on my own. And uh, I go and do stuff from the Sinatra-style type of album that I told you about. And I also do a lot of back rack material in it also. And I can do some of the R&B stuff that... Um, and it's great. I do I do the Donny Hathaway version of, of a song for you, you know, the yep. Leon Russell song. Yep. And to do it with a symphony in back of me and have real strings, it's it's just, uh, it, you know, I mean, it's it's like sitting in a Ferrari yeah. and just taking a ride if you're a race car yeah. driver, you know, it's it's really, really nice. So it, it really makes me happy to go out there and just do that, you know. JohnPagano.com. Yeah. And there, there's a link there where you can go into CD Baby and purchase the CD. Um, the, the the MCA record it's it's uh that's kind of difficult to find but yeah. you can't find it it's more their property than yeah, it is yeah, mine yeah. so I can't really sell it on on my on my website yeah. but but uh, you know it's out there obviously because you just brought some and it's <laughs> nice to see that it's out there so but yeah as far as my stuff goes and anything new that I do yeah. I'll be posting it up on johnpagano.com yeah thank you God bless to you and thank you for all your support and that's I really really appreciate it and to all your fans uh. It warms my heart to know that someone uh, appreciates what I do, especially on this, this end of the earth. It's really great, and I hope I can keep on um, supplying you with stuff. You're going to be the first to get anything that I do that's new, that's for sure. So, thank you very much. You're going to record this visually, too? Uh, <laughs> yeah, I wanted to. We don't to. <laughs> it's all right. We'll, we'll check it out. Yeah, we'll edit it. I don't we'll know what's in. about to come out. You know what I mean? It's yeah, been yeah. a while for me. Yeah. So, All right, so I'll just do a little bit of this. This yeah. is a little bit of Tenderly. Actually, here you go. Hey, what in there? All right. Let's see here. Is it the way you make me feel? How do I know that it's for real? Whoa, whoa. It's still a mystery. How do you always seem to know just when I need your love the most? I never had someone to give so tenderly.